Good afternoon. How are the Music at Noon lovers today? Good to see you. We're going to go back a few years today. We're going to go back to the High Baroque, and we're going to go back to the Classical period. And uh, we have two artists today, um, Faith, uh, excuse me, Faith Volrath is our harpsichordist, and she has played a number of solo harpsichord concerts at Music at Noon. And we are fortunate that she brought one of her many friends today, who is Alexandra Roder, and she is playing not just the cello, but the Baroque cello. She's going to get it fixed, though, before the concert starts. Stop. Well, um, the music that you'll hear today was composed by some performers that you may not be familiar with because in that period of time between 1685 and 1750 there were some pretty great composers that overshadowed the lesser known but not necessarily less great you're going to hear some great composers today so enjoy your introduction to some new friends, new composers today, and please welcome harpsichordist Faith Volrath and Baroque cellist Alessandra Roder. Good afternoon. Um, thanks, Brad, for the intro. So I'm going to talk at first a little bit about my cello here. It was made by Andrea Castagneri, who was an Italian living in Paris. So it's a French cello to the assessors, not an Italian. It is a French cello. Italian cellos tend to be extremely expensive. This is merely French. It is a lovely instrument made in 1743 in Paris, and at the time it would have been four strings. You may notice if you're familiar with normal cello sizes that it's a little bit small. This is what was known at the time as a lady's size. Ladies' size. Yes, women played the cello in the 18th century, their corsets and their skirts did not hamper them. They still had legs. They still could move their bodies. So yes, they played the cello, and it probably would have had four strings, not five. And I'll talk more about that transition later on in the program. The Gemignani Cello Sonatas, you're going to hear number two today, were written or published in 1746. So it is quite likely that whoever purchased this instrument would have played those sonatas for their own enjoyment, and it just makes me tingle to think about that. So, uh, anything else I wanted to say? Um, nope, I think that's about it that I wanted to introduce the program with. Um, please enjoy.
So the cello is about 280 years old and we've made our program all around the year that it was created, 1743. The harpsichord is not that old. Um, it is about 50 years old. Uh, this is my harpsichord named Bubba and on the car on the way here I realized that last year was Bubba's 50th birthday but I missed the event. So 51 years old. Uh, the next piece on the program is also by Gemignani, who was an Italian composer. Uh, much of his music would have been played in France. This is a solo harpsichord piece. And what he did is he took his violin sonata collection and arranged some of the pieces for harpsichord. And while they're in collections in his violin music in suites, he kind of picked and chose uh, what he liked when it went to the harpsichord. And he sort of made them in sets, but not really. He did kind of whatever he liked. They're really interesting, though, because we can see how he takes a violin work and turns it into something beautiful for just solo harpsichord. So this is two movements, um, and I hope you enjoy. Thank 
did forget to mention the reason that I played that piece is they were published in 1743. So same year as the cello was made. Okay, moving on to what is probably one of my favorite pieces in the cello repertoire. You probably have not heard of Barriere, but you have heard him. Bobby McFerrin, Bobby McFerrin does it a lot better on one of his CDs. Anyone heard the piece? Vaguely familiar? Yeah. Yeah. So he wrote a couple of um, bangers, I think the kids would call them these days. Um, he was a very well-known French cellist. Like, he frequented the king's court. He was born in 1707 and died in 1747, so far too brief a life. But he did publish four books of cello sonatas. This is the sixth one from the second book, I think. Yes. Um, they are all equally gorgeous and diverse and very much get to show off everything that, that the cello can do. You may have noticed, if you are very observant, that I have only been using the bottom four strings of my cello. And that's because in the 1740s, that's all that would have existed. So I'm, and the music was written clearly for those four strings by the um, various double stops and finger movements that are required. So I will continue to do that until the Baccarini um, at the end of the program. And um, for those of you who are not entirely familiar yet with the difference between Baroque and modern cello, um, most Baroque cellos were actually larger than modern cellos. The, the cello's size did not really stabilize until the middle of the 18th century, a couple decades after this was built. And in the 17 tens to 1760s, the cello could have anywhere from three to six strings. It was still a, a relatively new 
um, offshoot of the smaller violin instruments, and they came in all sorts of sizes. Stradivarius in Italy standardized the sizes, but many makers, including uh, the French ones such as Castagnetti, did not bother with those sizes because they could do it better, of course. Another interesting thing I wanted to point out about my cello is the scroll, which has this beautiful shell carving. Um, afterwards, if people are very delicate, they maybe can come up and look. But this was likely not carved by Castagnetti, but by any number of the women making their living in Paris at the time by doing piecework, carving scrolls, making frogs for bows, and going door to door and selling them to the well-known male instrument makers. Um, so I could at some point probably dive into the archives of the ph photographs we have of many of the scrolls from Paris um, at the era and find out perhaps exactly who had made it. So please enjoy this Barriere Sonata, one of his many gems for the cello. sensitive to temperature and humidity. Thank you. 
Jean-Philippe Rameau was one of the most uh, prominent and well-known French composers of the Baroque era. And so why this next piece by him is not necessarily from 1743, his music would have been heard throughout France. Uh, his keyboard works are written during the 1720s, and then during the 1730s and 40s, he starts becoming very famous for his operas. Um, so his works are pieces that anyone at that time would have heard. This piece is named after the Cyclops, a mythological creature that had one eye in its forehead. There are a couple different stories based around the Cyclops. One of them, and this is the one I feel the piece is based off of, uh, has to do with the Cyclops having a forge where they would make hammers, things like that. And in this forge, they made a lightning bolt for Zeus. And so in this piece, you're going to be able to hear a lot of hammers going on, and you'll also be able uh, to hear the lightning bolts go back and forth. So it's a very programmatic piece. Um, so. Rameau also for this piece invented a new type of hand sort of motion to play. It's called the battery and it involves crossing your fingers over back and forth. So it's a very virtuosic piece as well. Thank you. 
So Baccarini, who I'm ho I hope many of you have heard of, um, ba -da 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 -ba 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 -da -ba. Uh, anyone remember the Grey Poupon mustard ad with that? Okay, I'm dating myself. Um, the, so Baccarini, like this cello, was born in 1743. He was Italian, but he worked mostly in Spain. Um, but he was well acquainted with the famous uh, composers and musicians of the rest of Europe. Remember how small Europe is. People really could travel to and from cities. It was a little harder than nowadays, but they communicated quite regularly. And by the late 18th century, European culture was, um, was almost deliberately unifying in the classical music world. Um, this was the beginning of the Paris Conservatory system, which sought to unify instrumental techniques. I believe that happened in 1787, or maybe that was a French Revolution. Um, they, they coincide. And so the Baccarini is an interesting piece because there are f at least four different editions that all have slightly different ornamental um, fireworks in them. And rather like this cello, it's gone through a number of modernizations and editings, and numerous cellists would create their own editions. They would take liberties with the harmonies. Um, so I thought it was a nice piece to represent the, the way that technology, instruments, and music change over time. It doesn't happen overnight. We all didn't wake up yesterday and decide to go out and get the newest iPhone. Um, is anyone here still on a flip phone, for instance? Like, we keep things, we keep our cars, we keep our kitchen appliances, you know. Um, and same thing with uh, 1771, when this sonata was published. People would have been playing on their older instruments, they would have been playing not on the latest bow. Um, so I'm presenting you two movements, the most famous two movements of the sonata in A major, and I do get to use my fifth string, because Baccarini, we know, had a six-string cello that he would uh, play second violin parts on quite frequently. He also played them on a four-string cello because he was kind of, um, oh, I can't say that word in a church, can I? He was kind of really, really good at cello. Please enjoy. about Baccarini. A few more cool facts about Baccarini as I'm sitting here. They had to exhume his grave several decades ago because it was in, an, um, in the middle of construction in a cathedral. Musicologists leapt at the chance to go and examine his body. He had tuberculosis. Um, I don't know how they diagnosed this, but he probably also had major depression. And then also he had scoliosis and his leg bones were quite bent from literally having grown around his instrument. Uh, so that's a lesson to any of you taking cello, you know, keep your back strong and don't grow around your instrument. On the other hand, he wrote some beautiful music from his tortured existence. So uh, again, please enjoy. Thank you. 
Thank you all so much for coming today. If you would like to come up and see our instruments afterwards, please do. We are happy to tell you all about them. Thank you again. And I'll talk about you just in a moment, but before you leave, be sure to pick up a free CD or two or three. Um, a Music at Noon um, fan is donating CDs here, so help yourself. If you want to make a donation, we, we could use that as well. But back to the concert information. Thank you for the history that you gave us, for sharing the birthday of your old friend there, Alexandra. How many years old is your cello? It's from 1743. I'm not... Uh, 280. It's 280. It's 280. It's 80? Well, it's approaching 300 years, yeah. isn't it? Yeah. So her cello made in France. Yes, made in Paris. Made in Paris, and perhaps played some of the music that she played Quite today. Quite likely. Quite likely. These were very popular composers, very well known. Popular and composers. There was a huge well, sheet music industry at the time. We're not getting you on live stream now at all. Yeah. So if you want to be on live stream, oh. I'll share this with you. Sure. So if you've I'm trying to think of a modern counterpart for how common it was for people to just go out and buy some sheet music to take home and play on their instruments. Whether it was the correct instrument or not, I mean, how often do you buy something that you don't quite have the equipment for, but you want to mess around with it anyway? Um, so yeah, people would buy sheet music, they'd buy the latest sonatas, play around with them, discard them, um, dig them out 20 years later and go, oh yeah, I really liked that piece. And Faith, thank you so much for all the work that you and your parents go through to help you transport this huge instrument, a two-manual harpsichord that has such wonderful resonant bass. We're not used to that. We have a toy, a toy harpsichord here, which works okay in certain ways. But yours fills the space, and the depth of it is just so sonorous and so beautiful. But you have to transport it, so that takes real dedication. And you've been doing that for quite a few years. And um, so thank you both for giving us such wonderful variety today and helping us to learn more about the great composers that sometimes become overshadowed by the popular names, composers. Thank you so much. You. Next week we have an amazing pianist. I call her the Horowitz of pianists. She comes from the Bay Area. She'll play some of your favorite music. We're talking <laughs> Scarlatti, Beethoven, Debussy, Liszt, and more. Please come and fill the space. And please help yourself to CDs. We have a wide range of genre over there. Thank you. Have a great week. Bye for now. Uh, so the end pin was around in 1740, but um, it wasn't commonly used except by very fat people, very short people, and women. So I should probably have one. Um, yeah, but nothing was standardized, you know, you just kind of set it and played it. I mean, it's kind of no wonder Baccarini grew around the cello. Yeah. 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 He, was, he was quite literally bent. But he probably started playing when he was four, and there was no standard schooling, so that's all he would have done. I would think to give that. So now you have a fifth string? I have a fifth string. It was put on sometime in the 1990s. I haven't been able to trace the whole history. But you can see on the scroll, see how there are the, the other peg holes that have been filled in? So it's been four strings, five strings, four strings, five strings over its lifetime, yeah. Wow. Heavily edited. But yeah, there's like dirt and wear on here for <laughs> nearly 300 years. years. Yeah. It's amazing. It is amazing. Yeah. I'm, I'm deeply privileged to have had the, the resources to get it when it was for sale. Yeah. Thanks, Grandpa. You were a horrible person, but you gave me money. <laughs> you know, this other thing over here looks pretty interesting, too. Yeah, definitely ask Faith about it.
Hello. Hi. Enjoyed it. There's Thank a, you. There's a very famous story I've heard of Paganini, the violinist, actually broke a string during a concert. Yes. yes. And, and continued and on continue playing. playing. Yes. Yeah. Yes. And then I have a, okay. another story to share. So, okay. um, you know who okay. Napoleon was, of course. Yes. So, Napoleon at one point had the cellist do court, like similar era, okay. to come to his court. Yeah, well, and two, Napoleon said, May I try your cello? <laughs> Duport had one of those fancy Italian yeah. instruments, a strat. Napoleon still had a hat on his boots with spurs. So there are Napoleon spur marks in a Stradivarius cello. The same one that I believe Jacqueline Dupre played on. I don't know who has it now, but yeah. These things have so much history. I'm like, who did that? I didn't. My cat left some marks on the front. That's my cat. Um, and I have some sweat marks, but I don't know where all the injuries come from. But nearly 300 years of people playing it and loving it and, and begging their parents not to have to practice. Somebody, yeah, yeah. I mean, they need regular maintenance. They need to be played regularly. The worst thing, you, but the worst thing that can happen to an instrument is that it doesn't get played. Really? Yeah. So, like in the Smithsonian, they have regular concerts with musicians to come in and play their instruments yes. to keep them fresh. Otherwise, they do what luthiers call mellowing, which is not a good thing. They just they become sort of uh, brittle because the wood the wood vibrates when it plays, so that changes like molecular alignment or something. I don't know. I don't know the physics, but yeah, they thrive on being played. Yeah. That's great. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for coming. Well, thank you so much for the information. Oh, it, this instrument generally thrives. Well, they didn't have plastic in the old days. You are correct. So these would have been made out of wood. And then my plectrum and this harpsichord are plastic, but then they would have had them on the So, and actually, the makers of harpsichords now are going to match the So, it's, it's better, actually. You would think maybe it's less now that the first lasts longer. And when these break, um, the plastic ones, it just snaps. So, you lose a note in a concert, like you thought it was. But a bird will split, and the note will get softer, but you won't lose it. So, it's actually better for performing. They come all apart. So this just gets pushed up to like special mechanics on a lever and then that's the flux. That's good. Would you play a few notes? Let's see how it comes out. Yeah. So, um, there's two different keyboards, and so one keyboard sounds like this, sounds like this, and it's a little slightly soft. Yeah, the same pitch, but they sound a little different. And then I can do what's called